Rolling. Welcome, everybody. Um, on behalf of the American Institute of Professional Geologists, welcome to today's webinar about learning outcomes from virtual field trips. <clears throat> today's webinar was developed by Tom Roberto, our guest speaker, during his graduate work at Arizona State University. My name is Anna Sutton. I'm, I'm coming to you from the Chicago area. I currently serve as the AIPG Illinois Indiana section president, and I also chair AIPG's National Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. I'm going to serve as a moderator during today's webinar. I'll quickly cover some introductory material and then we'll turn the presentation over to our speaker. So as I said, today's webinar is based on Tom's graduate work, and we hope that his work becomes a resource that you can use on the job and in discussions with your academic contacts after today's webinar. I know Tom is going to be happy to answer lots of questions and point you in the right direction for any projects that you have related to this topic. For those of you who may be new to the Institute, uh, more information about AIPG is available on our website, AIPG.org. AIPG was founded in 1963. It's the largest association dedicated to promoting geology as a profession. It presently has more than 5,000 members in the US and abroad organized into 35 regional sections. The Institute adheres to the pr principles of professional responsibility and public service and is the only international organization that certifies the competence and ethical conduct of geological scientists in all branches of the science with members employed in industry, government, and academia. AIPG emphasizes competence, integrity, and ethics, and is an advocate for the profession and communicates regularly, regularly to federal and state legislators and agencies on matters pertaining to the geosciences. If you're newer to AIPG and you'd like to become more involved, please reach out to me or any of the contacts you find on the website. We'd be happy to bring you in and, and get you started working together with us. I'm now excited to introduce our speaker for today's webinar. Tom Roberto recently completed his PhD at Arizona State University, super recently, yay. <laughs> his work has been studying the effectiveness of place-based geoscience virtual field trips. So Tom is a lifelong technologist and has extensive experience in the production of immersive and interactive digital content. Um, and he's helping, he's, he's interested in helping others understand the promise and the peril of the Anthropocene. And he plans on passing on his skills in virtual field trip production. I'll now turn today's presentation over to Tom Roberto. Thank you for joining us, Tom. Well, thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here and um, thank you for the congratulations. Um, my PhD is uh, a week or two old, uh, so I'm very new to this club. Um, so today I just wanna share with you um, some of the research I did. I, I spent my master's um, program uh, looking at uh, the differences between in-person and virtual field trips. Um, specifically learning outcomes. And uh, that's what I'm going to be sharing with you today. Um, in a nutshell, um, virtual field trips uh, are an effective way uh, to learn. Uh, so with armed with that knowledge, I spent my um, PhD dissertation years um, looking at how to get more quality content uh, into the field. Um, because the uh, uh, as a, a little background, the virtual field trip used in the research I'm going to share with you today was developed by ETX, um, which is a research group education through exploration at Arizona State University. Um, and these types of uh, virtual field trips can take um, up to a year to develop um, with a team of 20 plus people from subject matter experts to learning designers to videographers. Um, so it's a rather intense process. and um, once the research group learned uh, that these are an effective way to learn, we kind of flipped uh, the model on its head and said, how can we decentralize this process? And can we teach teachers and students how to make their own VFTs? Um, so hopefully that will be a topic for a future uh, uh, a future discussion. Hey, okay, hopefully you're seeing my uh, intro screen. So I want to acknowledge um, my research partners, uh, Chris Mead, Ari Lambar, and Steve Semkin. And Ariel and Steve were both on my uh, PhD committee. Um, 
I will provide a link. Um, this is actual, uh, the title you're looking at is the paper that uh, just was published uh, recently in the Journal of Geoscience Education. My, my real uh, research motivation is to um, facilitate the widespread uh, production and consumption of these virtual field trips. I'm really interested in the promise and peril of the Anthropocene and think that uh, virtual field trips uh, can be a very effective way uh, to educate people about uh, the promise and perils that we're about to face. So let's talk a minute about on-ground and virtual field education. Um, my master's thesis started with two pages of quotes from geologists uh, that spanned almost 200 years that in essence said, um, the best geologist is the one who sees the most rocks. Um, so this was a pretty charged field I, I jumped into um, as a virtual person. Um, but fieldwork is foundational. Um, you can't overestimate the perceived importance among geoscientists and educators. And then there's a long history of documentation on cognitive effective behavioral and career related benefits of getting out into the field and working in a group. Um, my apologies for this slide, a little dense, but um, the challenges to in-person field trips are, are really well documented also. Uh, you have budgetary and liability issues uh, that are faced, um, logistical and safety concerns, uh, and uh, accessibility barriers for students with uh, disabilities. Um, field camps in particular uh, require uh, additional tuition and fees. Um, this raises questions of equity and fairness. And um, I saw firsthand in, I, I spent almost the last 10 years uh, in community um, undergrad and graduate school. Field trips, even short ones, they really place unequal demands on students who either um, have caregiving or uh, responsibilities or have to work outside of school. And um, the difference that I saw from my first time in college uh, in my 20s um, versus 35 years later, um, the number of students that worked, the number of non-traditionally aged students that had to either take care of children or parents. Um, so this whole idea of equity um, and, and inclusion has become very important to me in my work um, in allowing people to visit places and learn about places they might otherwise never get to. Um, the um, students that have never been in the field, um, they get distracted. Um, uh, personal safety, comfort, performance, social interactions. And these uh, issues were all studied by Orion um, and termed novelty space issues. So if you've never been in the field, um, um, your, the affective realm is really impacted. Um, where do I go to the restroom? Where can I get water? Are my hiking shoes good enough? And although all of these things seem trivial, they really do negatively impact field learning. You know, I, one of the reasons to jump into this and to try to present evidence-based research on their effectiveness, um, the COVID-19 disruption um, really brought this concern to the uh, forefront. Um, all of a sudden, in-person field trips were not feasible. And uh, what was interesting was my little master's thesis that sat in obscurity in some ASU repository all of a sudden was downloaded uh, extensively for people trying to justify um, that you could learn uh, using virtual field trips. So for these reasons, um, I think VFTs are going to be more commonly seen and used. And I think the, uh, the importance of comparative research uh, is even more important. So just quickly, what is a virtual field trip? It's been touted as a possible solution to the challenges of in-person since the early 90s. Um, they are basically multimedia productions. They incorporate um, text, audio, graphics, still images, mapping, um, gigapans, things like that. And they allow you to experience a real world environment without the cost of being there. Uh, they're not truly virtual yet. Um, it's difficult to walk within or manipulate elements of a 3D space. Uh, but that, uh, that paper, if you know it, is 2017. Um, I can now do. Um, laser scans of a trail or a geologic site of interest, uh, put you in a VR headset and, and let you uh, uh, walk through that space. Um, that kind of program, it's basically creating a geoscience education video game 
is in its infancy, but um, you're going to be able to walk through a space very soon. And I'll show you some things that uh, I've done that you can view on your computer screen um, to give you a hint of what's coming. Um, and these virtual field trips allowed you to interact through participation. Um, you can explore and analyze, learn and, and test your skills. Um, you can do all of these things uh, within the virtual field trip environment. Um, so what's in there? Um, typically, when we talk about a virtual field trip, we're talking about a multimedia experience that's anchored by high resolution 360 spherical images. Um, that gives you a sense of immersion or a sense of like you're there. And then it can include gigapixel, um, super high res images down to microscopic uh, images and traditional photos. Um, you can incorporate all sorts of photo and video formats from 2D, 3D, um, 180 and 360. Um, you'll see a lot of mapping and illustrations. You can bring in um, GIS maps and data, um, later scans. Um, we've built a number of three-dimensional rocks that you can grab and spin around. And then, of course, you can have about texts and PDFs. Um, and these can range from something that's a guided inquiry. I built a, uh, a, a field trip to um, a mountain on the ASU Tempe campus. Um, and it's a guided inquiry where you print out a PDF and the PDF guides you through what to look at. And on the other range, they can be completely interactive and adaptive. Um, that uh, describes the one that was used in this study where you don't need anything. You can take notes on your computer. Um, they're smart. Um, there are learning trees in the background where if you answer a question incorrectly, we can pop up a video to correct the misconception right there and then. Um, so there's different levels and types of VFTs, but this is typically what's contained within one. Um, as far as these things working, um, you know, when we first started out, we couldn't find any direct comparisons in literature, um, but we're starting to see studies now that show that um, they, uh, they are effective in raising interest and engagement. Um, some have measured learning gains and they're showing um, generally positive results. Uh, there's been some work in augmented reality, um, and that's where um, you either are walking along a trail with your phone and it's GPS aware. So as you go by something, it can pop up something on your phone um, uh, as an additional piece of information. You can also do that with a pair of AR glasses. Um, and Clipple did some work in a VR headset um, that observed higher lab grades in the virtual group than the in-person group. And then Zhao uh, did a, a study uh, comparing browser-based virtual uh, to in-person field trips, which is similar to what I did. Um, but that study relied on students' self-reported learning experience um, uh, and did not directly measure learning, which we tried to do in this study. So here are my research questions. Um, how does the achievement of common learning outcomes differ between participants in the in-person and virtual? And then what attitudinal differences? Um, so I looked into um, both learning outcomes and the effect of them. Um, were they nervous? Were they excited? Uh, those types of things. I've got a screen up here just as a quick uh, refresher of the great unconformity. This was uh, central to both groups. Um, they did a uh, pre and post concept sketch of the great unconformity. That was um, the main way we uh, determined uh, learning outcomes. So. Uh, the lab exercise or the field trip occurred uh, late in the semester. Early in the semester, the students have been um, taught how to do concept sketches and the great unconformity was introduced. So they had uh, learned about it earlier in the semester. Later in the semester, and uh, I'll go through this as we get into the methods, um, they were asked without warning and without notes to do a concept sketch um, on a Friday. And that Saturday, they either went up to the Grand Canyon or they did the virtual field trip. And then again, without warning and without notes, that following Monday, they were asked to do another concept sketch. So we developed a rubric and were able to compare pre and post concept sketches uh, between the two modalities. So we had uh, two classes. We had a, a intro um, historical geology class, and that was populated by mostly non-majors. And then we had an advanced uh, regional geology class. It was on the um, geology of the uh, American Southwest. Um, and that served mostly majors. 
Um, and this was done at ASU. And again, for the same credit, students chose to either do the in-person field trips at Grand Canyon National Park, or they could do the um, virtual experiment. So the in-person groups um, collectively as a group, they viewed the canyon from rim level and then took an instructor guided inquiry hike along the trail of time uh, along the south rim. The VFT students, they individually explored the Grand Canyon from river level and then took a guided inquiry virtual tour of the canyon geology. Um, and we did our best to mimic the in-person field trip uh, whenever possible. It was, uh, the content was presented um, in a similar order and in a similar way uh, to both park groups. And then the um, exploration and inter interpretation of the great unconformity, as I had mentioned before, um, that was the main focus of each of the trips. So just to give you a feel, um, that's uh, back to you is Professor Steve Semkin, and he's leading a group along the Trail of Time. The Trail of Time is about a mile um, uh, trail along the south rim of the canyon, and every meter either represents a year, then it jumps to 10,000 years, and then millions of years. And as you walk this mile, um, you can observe all of the uh, rocks through time and travel the 1.7 billion years of exposed rock in the canyon. Um, so that's what the in-person uh, group looked like. Um, this is one of the views um, that they had, and I don't know if you can see my cursor, but there's the great unconformity right there. So this was one of the views that they had of the great unconformity from rim level. Um, there were also along the trail of time wayside panels. So there was a brief lecture here um, by the professor uh, regarding the great unconformity, and they could learn about the missing um, rock from the wayside panel. And then there were also viewing tubes um, that were pointed directly at the great unconformity. And this is just a blow up of the wayside panel. So this was the exposure um, during the in-person field trip that the students had with the great unconformity. Now the virtual students um, did this on the computer. So here you can see uh, a student. Um, actually, I have to confess, this is my son doing this. And this picture was taken uh, at three in the morning the night before I defended my master's to include in my presentation. But this is what the students would see. And what's interesting is, um, you know, the virtual field trip allows us to do um, image overlays so you can blow up all of these pictures. You can see that um, you've got a, a, a box here um, that gives you instructions on things, what to do. You can take notes within this. Um, but this would just give you a feel for a couple of the screens that they saw. Um, Here's uh, uh, Dr. Semkin um, talking about the great unconformity in a pop-up video uh, within Blacktail Canyon. The other interesting thing that um, the, the VFT platform allows you to do some overlays and some things that you couldn't do in the field necessarily. Um, so here you can see um, he's showing the uh, two different rock units and their orientation. So let me get into some of the uh, data for you. Um, so the top, um, the top two are uh, an in-person uh, pre and post uh, concept sketch. And then the bottom two are a uh, virtual uh, pre and post concept sketch. And the um, one on top in person, um, both those scores were eight out of 17 uh, based on the rubric we used and uh, not much difference uh, between the two. And then the virtual one you can see started off as a six out of 17 and jumped to a 15 out of 17. And although those two may look similar to you, there's actually a considerable amount of additional information in that second um, virtual field trip sketch um, that it notes, uh, you can see it's got some uh, ages of the rock, the great unconformity is clearly marked. Um, you're seeing a uh, foliation uh, symbol. Um, so there were, um, there were some significant differences between the groups. Again, this was a 17 point rubric. And what you're looking at here are the pre and post um, rubric scores for all the groups. So remember I had um, uh, intro geology 102 class and we had in-person and virtual students with that. And then we had a upper level um, geology class, mostly of geology majors. Um, and we got a pre and post of the in-person and virtual. 
But what you're seeing here is um, the in-person. So those are my two blues. They both of those groups did experience learning gains. Um, however, neither of those gains were statistically significant. Um, oop, jumped ahead on me there. Whereas if you look at the green, um, they uh, experienced learning gains and both of those jumps for the virtual uh, groups were statistically significant. And as a matter of fact, the gains were not only statistically significant, they were about three times greater. Um, in the Geology 102 class, you can see that my initial scores are very similar. And then the jumps, the post is different. But if you look at my Geology 301, the higher group, you can see that the virtual field trip group, the pre-score was considerably less. Um, and what we attributed this to, um, let me go back there. We attributed this to, uh, this course was open to um, geology majors mostly, um, but there were also, it was also cross-listed with sustainability and uh, geography. And what the data showed was that the geology majors who had already been in the field um, it looks like they came in with greater prior knowledge um, than the uh, geography and the sustainability uh, majors. So their initial uh, score was higher. But if you notice um, the virtual group in the green, um, they did close the gap um, by the time uh, the post came around. And again, their gain was statistically significant. What's interesting too is um, you can see uh, both the undergrad or the lower level and the upper level class, um, almost 90% are more interested in visiting um, the Grand Canyon in person after the virtual field trip. So you often get a pushback if um, you know students won't wanna go if they can just go there on the computer. And um, the research uh, did not bear that out at all. So what happened uh, between the two groups? So both modalities, um, the students uh, met the learning outcomes. Uh, guided inquiry exercise scores were very similar, so I didn't get into that, but the, um, they both had a, a guided inquiry exercise uh, before getting into the nuts and bolts of the actual um, unconformity uh, learning session. Um, the in-person students were allowed to um, wander the trail in, and they had um, a, a series of questions they had to answer. And, Similarly, in the virtual field trip, they were allowed to free explore a portion of the canyon um, virtually and had to answer the same questions as the in-person did. Um, and both of those scored very similarly. I shared with you the pre to post concept sketch scores. They both increased, but the virtual field trip group was statistically significant and three times greater. And then the pre-scores were similar. Um, that was expected for the non-majors. And I think we talked about that um, that preference for the uh, geo majors um, to go in the field and had uh, more previous knowledge. Um, however, the virtual field trip students um, did close the gap in post. And then as far as attitude, behavior, and learning, um, you know, the affective realm, um, we used uh, uh, PANIS, that's the, um, it measures a uh, positive and negative affect score. Um, and, uh, we did a pre and post uh, with each of the groups. Both of those modalities met or exceeded um, the PA averages. In a nutshell, um, emotionally, um, both uh, the virtual and in-person uh, students uh, were in an, uh, a state that was conducive to learning. They both increased PA and decreased negative, uh, which is um, what we were hoping for. Um, but we had a, a, a the GLO 102 group in person, um, that was not the case. Um, and uh, we're, still, we're still trying to figure out why exactly that was. Um, possibly novelty space. Um, they were nervous about uh, going into the field and uh, the bus ride was long. There, there's a couple of things that could have um, played into that. Um, and the positive effect scores for the um, the upper level class, um, the in-person was significantly higher um, than the virtual field trip group. Um, and I think that the um, preference um, by geo majors, um, they were excited to go into the field um, 
and they were not worried about novelty space at all because as uh, these were juniors and seniors majoring in geology, they had been in the field before. So that novelty space uh, wasn't an issue for them. And I think uh, the BFT increases um, were most likely due to um, them not having to deal with the novelty space that the in-person groups did. Um, and the VFT just offers uh, an enhanced uh, learning environment. Um, it may seem counterintuitive, but a lot of the um, open-ended questions that we asked, we received comments um, from the in-person group that um, I was one of 25 students. I was in the back. I couldn't hear the professor. Um, the wind was blowing. I was distracted. Um, you had a, a lot of things um, suggesting, um, even though they were in person, that they didn't um, feel connected to the professor. And then in the virtual field trip uh, questions that we, uh, we received, they felt like they had a one-on-one -on -one relationship because it was just them watching a video of the professor. Um, so there's some interesting dynamics at play here um, with both uh, in-person and in virtual. Um, I think the other thing, um, why I can't call this an apples to apples comparison, um, I'm going to try to set up a study that will compare um, something that's uh, more closely related. Um, I think the VFT, um, increases can also uh, were affected by perspective. So if you remember the in-person students were wandering the trail of time and they were up on the rim viewing down into the canyon, the great unconformity that was a mile away and then they had wayside panels versus the virtual students who were watching a video of Professor Semkin literally touching the contact between the uh, the uh, two units in the great unconformity. Um, so they were at river level um, experiencing this and their comments said often mentioned close up views, they felt like they were there. Um, so I think that's another reason why we saw the increases in the um, virtual um, versus the in-person. What did I learn? I, I got reinforced how central um, uh, field learning is to geoscience education. Um, but the truth is not all students have equal access to field-based learning. Um, as the technology gets less expensive and more complex, as is always the case, these virtual field experiences are becoming more immersive, rich, and then um, student-centered. So um, intelligent systems um, allow you to design these with logic trees um, that uh, are, it's really active learning. The student is in charge and, um, you can pop up uh, uh, videos and other things to correct misconceptions as you go along. Um, I really feel that for many, uh, virtual field trips are gonna be the only practical option um, to explore pedagogically rich but inaccessible places. Um, you know, it's all that uh, uh, my professor, Steve Semkin, and I mentioned him, he was my PhD advisor, if I didn't mention that. Um, but it's all he can do to get a bus to bring 25 students up to the South Grand, the Grand Canyon. And that's from Phoenix, uh, about a four hour drive. So that's a long day and up and back. Um, he could never get a bunch of students down to river level um, for an experience like that. Um, but if one group goes down to build a virtual field trip, um, you can get students down there. So my big takeaway is, you know, the measured learning outcomes of the VFT um, equal or exceeded the in-person. So I don't want to suggest that um, virtual field trips replace field work. Um, that's not my goal. Um, but if an in-person field trip is not available, um, then I firmly believe that a virtual field trip um, can be a suitable alternative. Um, and in some, in some uh, cases, uh, may be able to replace um, some field-based learning. So that is... Um, that is a quick overview of uh, the paper that just got released. Um, I have um, some additional slides if there is interest um, on some of the software and hardware that goes into building these and some workflows. That's basically what I did for my PhD dissertation. So for now, I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, take any questions and we can jump in uh, to some of those slides and I can discuss that at length. Um, uh, based on the questions that we have.
Thank you so much, Tom. Oh, Lucy brought up, I wonder if there is a difference in long-term knowledge. I feel like a trip to the Grand Canyon is quote unquote unforgettable. Um, yeah, I wonder which parts of the trip would be unforgettable. Yeah, so in the, in the paper, um, you know, I put that as a limitation. Um, this was Grand Canyon National Park, one of the wonders of the world. Um, so um, would this have been the same if they had just gone out to Tempe Butte on the ASU campus? Um, uh, I did that study and I, I replicated these results. Um, and what's even, um, what's even more long-term though, um, my, my PhD research was on not only trying to develop a workflow for teachers and students to build these, but I was really interested on the impact the production process had on um, sense of place. And sense of place is the attachments we form to a place, both emotionally and intellectually. Um, and it has um, a whole set of learning outcomes um, you know, from cognitive to the affective realm. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested now in the production versus just the consumption. Um, I don't know that this um, one hour um, intervention, I don't know if we went back and tested the students one year later, what kind of retention there would be. Um, so that's, a, that's another research question that um, we're gonna look into. I also think, um, you know, is, is the sweet spot for undergraduate non-geology majors or non-science majors who are taking geology to um, fulfill science requirements at the university, thinking that a two semester track in geology will be more acceptable than chemistry, biology, or physics. You know, is the sweet spot there for virtual field trips versus if you're a geo major? Um, so a, a lot of, uh, boy, what I found out in the last few years is every question I answered uh, generated 10 more. So there's a, there's a lot of work to do yet. Thanks, Tom. Uh, ter Terry, Tari, I apologize right. if I not uh, yeah. said that right, but please go ahead. Um, yeah, I, 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 one of my challenges, I, and I think I've seen that uh, voiced in the chat as well, is the time and technology and resources to build these amazing field trips that you guys have built that I've actually used, um, Dinosaur Doom and Blacktail Canyon. Right. They're amazing. Um, but yeah, I just, at a community college, I don't have those resources. So just to kind of let people know, I have actually built some pretty immersive field trips just using Google Earth as platform. Mm -hmm. because they already have existing photospheres and then you can actually maybe do things that are more local and I've augmented those with just um, photospheres and high def fo photos that I've taken on my phone um, and and just kind of supplemented that with links to um, websites and so on and, and drawings that I've done myself so it's kind of a cheap poor person's option um, for uh, for people if if they're thinking of building their own um, but it'd be nice to actually, you know, you guys have a good platform for us to use those field trips. Um, yeah, but thank you for them. I appreciate them very much. Uh, well, Terry, what, what you do, I wouldn't call um, low end at all. <laughs> it, 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 that was the whole point of my PhD was to try to identify a workflow and then how you can do this with your, your cell phone and um, various software platforms that are available to you. So I'll bring up some of the slides, but you know, um, Google Earth is one um, where you can create KML files. Um, you can do story maps in ArcGIS. And then there are a number of uh, Kula.com, um, Memento 360. There are a number of sites that are free or in the $10 a month range where you can upload 360s and then it's a point and click. It's almost like building a PowerPoint presentation. Um, you know, click here and I want a photo to pop up when they click on this little icon. Um, so I'll go over some of those things, um, but um, I've become obsessed with trying to give teachers and students the tools to build these on their own, just to get more quality local content out there. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm thrilled that you're doing this already. That's exciting. Yeah, and there's a related question here from um, Jay Mowersberg. Uh, what is the cost and time involved in preparing the VFTs for a lesson? So, I mean, that can range from, um, 
you know, a few days to uh, six months to 12 months, if you look at, um, and I've got a slide with some links and I'll, I'll share it. Um, you know, the, the group I was part of, Education Through Exploration, um, I think the website is vft.asu.edu. Um, so most of those are done under a NASA grant um, and our Infinisco project. But those can take six to 12 months um, to lay out the, um, uh, the lesson plan and, and who your target audience is and what assets exist, what assets do you need to get um, versus um, if you wanted to go to the, um, you know, a, a river and uh, that's by your uh, school or work and with your cell phone, you know, if you laid that out um, in 30 or 60 minutes, what a node or two would look like, I might need to tell this little story I want to tell. I might need two 360 images and you can take those with your phone um, and have your phone stitch those together. You know, those would take literally five minutes to grab you can shoot photos with your phone. Most of the camera phones today are extremely high res. And with a little um, and inexpensive VR tripod for 70, 50, $70, something like that, and a phone mount and a little uh, $25 uh, shotgun microphone that clips to your cell phone, you could literally either shoot yourself as the subject matter expert or someone else um, as a subject matter expert um, and shoot those videos. So you, you could build something in one to two days um, from layout to grabbing the content to then going on a platform and building it. Um, and uh, the research group at ASU um, has launched Tourit, which is um, an open source um, virtual tool uh, to build these things. That's pretty intuitive. So um, they hope to go public with that soon. Um, where uh, teachers can just go on there and use that as a platform to build. Um, and it, it will uh, connect to your, uh, your learning management system, things like that. Um, but there are, there are very inexpensive tools now available uh, that allow you to build these in a short time. And I, I don't know if I missed you mentioning this, Tom. Did you, did you reference Esri's story map for VFTs? Yeah, the, Esri, yes, the story okay. maps. You yeah. can do those too, yes. And Dawn had asked, um, what are some of the VFTs already available that you would recommend with notations of cost to access? Well, um, I, I, so let me, let me put the web address in the chat. So if you haven't been to, if you haven't been to the um, VFT site at ASU, those are all available um, for use now. Um, and there's some other, um, I'll, I'll put in the PDF slides, there are some other places um, that uh, have collections of these also. Okay, so if you want to try to build these on your own, here's, here's some of the things that you, you, not all are necessary. You can use your smartphone for the photos and videos um, or a, uh, you know, a regular camera. Um, most bridge mirrorless and cameras now shoot both photos and videos. Um, you can get, eight, in my experience, the one thing people will not forgive is bad audio. They'll deal with mediocre video, but if the audio is not good, people shut down. Um, so you can get an inexpensive um, shotgun microphone for your uh, smartphone, um, and that will override your internal microphone, and it will be significantly better, the audio, uh, than using that. Uh, and those are inexpensive. And then, of course, on the higher end, you can have wireless lapel mics and shotgun mics. Um, you know, a lighting equipment, um, you know, if you're in the shade or somebody's wearing a big brim hat, something as simple as your cell phone flashlight or a flashlight could, could light them up. Um, you're going to want a tripod uh, for, for shooting video. Um, if you're videoing yourself or a subject matter expert, there's no way around it. And a handhold for any length of time. We'll just introduce um, shakes. And then, uh, you know, there's nothing phenomenally uh, complex going on on the computer end. Um, you know, Photoshop or another photo editing program to clean up your photos and crop them in Adobe Premiere or um, any of the Apple products to um, produce your videos. Um, here are some of the companies that offer 360 cameras if you don't want to do them with your um, smartphone. But just know that there are apps on your smartphone that are either free or cost maybe $5. 
that'll let you just rotate and take the um, take the photos and it'll stitch it together and you have a 360 photo. Um, and these range from uh, you know a couple of hundred dollars to ten thousand dollars. You can spend whatever you want on a 360 camera depending on your budget and what you want to do. Um, you know, and as far as um, 360 photos, so here are some of the apps. Google Street View might be gone now um, as an app, but these are other um, apps that are either free or cost a dollar or two that you can download to your phone. Um, and these can shoot either spherical or cylindrical. So uh, a cylinder, you know, picture yourself inside of a, uh, a roll of paper towels. You're, you're shooting a cylinder. Um, versus spherical, where you're inside a ball. Um, so obviously the apps that let you do cylinder are much easier. You just point straight ahead, and you you know you won't get all of the ground, you won't get all of the sky, but you'll get you'll get the entire scene. Um, so those will you'll probably take maybe eight pictures with your phone. And these apps are pretty intuitive. They'll they know what you're looking at. They'll tell you to take a picture, then they'll tell you to turn and stop when they've got enough to stitch it with the other one. Um, and then you can imagine that a spherical is just more pictures than the cylindrical. So, so um, little grids will pop up um, and you'll have to take pictures up and down also. Um, and there are little heads that are uh, you could put on a tripod that will automate this process for you. Um, here's some of the um, software. So 3D Vista Pro is a desktop app. Um, that lets you build. I use this um, for the work I do with McGraw Hill. Um, and I can show you some of those. Um, Adobe Captivate is also another desktop app that will let you build pretty intense um, uh, digital experiences. Um, Kula is an online platform. Um, I use that. Um, so you can upload your 360 photos there and you can create overlays similar to what you're seeing on the screen um, where you can pop up a video or a slideshow or anything else. And then um, Memento 360 is another online platform um, that's similar to Kula. So those two are either free or very inexpensive if you wanted um, to build your own and, and host them somewhere. Um, and then Matterport is, uh, you know, you may be familiar with Matterport from um, doing virtual tours of uh, homes for sale. It started in real estate, but the latest cameras now can go outside. And I use the Matterport system to, um, to scan uh, the outside environment. And then Unity and Unreal Engine, that's where you're really diving into things, is where you're basically developing a web app that can be viewed on a computer or a headset. Um, but you're, you're developing basically a, a simple video game um, with a lot of moving parts. But those are some of the software programs that are available. Um, and then um, here's a couple, um, the uh, Grand Canyon South Rim um, and the Sedona and Oak Creek. Those are things that are sitting on my server that I've done for um, McGraw Hill. And that mystery of Black Tail Canyon is, um, that's on the uh, ASU BFT website that I shared with you. Um, and you can uh, go and take a look at that. And then uh, this is a really condensed sc screen of you know, the four major components of building these things. This is a one slide representing, you know, five years of PhD research, but I, I break these down into research and storyboarding. And those are some of the main things to think about. And then you've got to acquire the content. So you've got to go out and shoot it. Um, and then after you've got all of the stuff, you've got to produce and design it. And then the final stage is you've got to do some testing, um, you know, on different browsers and a smartphone versus a iPad versus a computer, and then launch it. So those are the basic uh, components of building these things. Just while you're navigating there, Tom, I, I yep. see a, a comment here that says, uh, never thought this much study had gone into virtual field trips. Good presentation. But how do we use a virtual hammer on a virtual rock? I think, I think that's content you can do. Well, when... <laughs> When we get into Unity and Unreal Engine, you know, I can do things in there that I can't do in the field. I can give you a virtual hammer. I could, I could put a 
door handle on a cliff side and let you open that and give you a cross section and let you see what's in there. Um, you know, yeah, you can do a lot of this stuff virtually. Uh, the, the, the first thing is let's bring students to a place that they can't get to. That, that was my initial motivation. So I'm using um, immersive photography and videography and teaching a lesson. Um, this next phase I'm in is how do I kind of replicate an actual in-person field trip? So the hammer, strike a dip, um, those kind of things. Yeah, we're, we're getting there. Um, we're getting there. It's, it's getting closer. Um, let me, I'm going to put a link in the chat box just in case. This is where I'm going to go on my browser and share with you. But I'll put that in there in case it's uh, it stutters at all. So let me share my screen again. Okay, so this is something that we worked on for um, McGraw Hill, and this is uh, Sedona and Oak Creek Canyon. I should say um, Steve Reynolds is also uh, one of my uh, advisors, so I've done a lot of work with Steve. But you know, these are just high res 360s. The kind are the foundation of these things. And then you can pop up videos and things um, underneath, and I can zoom in and, and zoom out. Um, what I want to show you here is let me go to Yava Pi Point. So this is another thing. And so this is then a gigapan. I'm blocking my up to the screen here. So hopefully you're seeing this gigapan, and this is probably 200 images stitched together, but this will give you an idea of how high resolution this is. You can just keep going and going. So this is using the Matterport system. So here we're, um, we've got Oak Creek, you know, so you can zoom around and look at here, but um, laser scanned a portion of this. So let me click on this for you. So now you can navigate this. I'm just using my arrow keys, but you can you can walk this space. And the other thing you can do, because this is a combination of lighter laser and photography, you can measure things doing this. So if you want to know, you know, that's 33 feet um, tall there. So these are some of the technologies that um, that we're, we're putting into these things um, right now, just to give you some examples. And then, uh, like I say, if you haven't seen it, so this is the um, all the virtual field trips that uh, ETX, that research group at ASU that I was part of has done. So there's a there's a bunch of them here with a, a bunch more in the pipeline, but you can click on any of these, and these are publicly available. Yeah, I think we've got a lot of questions on or what what's the what's the all encompassing list on publicly available VFTs that currently exist. I think people are really interested in that. I, I don't know if you have I, I, a I don't, list of that. I don't. I yeah. don't. I've been so immersed in in trying to figure out how these things work and how to build them. But that's that's one of my things is to try to compile a list um, that have been created by um, educators or research groups that um, um, can be uh, used as learning resources. Let me give you a sneak a, a sneak peek though into my my PhD work. Um, so we we knew that these things worked, and like I said, we wanted to try to flip the script. So we've been doing professional development um, seminars for middle school and high school teachers um, for their annual education requirements, and we've been teaching teachers how to do this. Um, and we've had great success with that. Um, but I also, um, we taught uh, two different um, undergrad slash grad courses in virtual field trip production uh, over the course of a year. So using just their smartphones and having access to, um, uh, to our, our, our online tool that's in production. Um, we had students um, spend the semester going through those four major um, sets that I showed you, um, storyboard and research, content acquisition, production and design, and then testing and implementation. 
and we had them build them in geology and we worked with the School of Sustainability. Um, so over the course of two semesters, um, those groups produced, uh, I think a total of nine to 12 VFTs, all of which were approved by subject matter experts and were used in other ASU courses as a digital learning experience for other students. So students were able to learn how to build these. Um, they were able to go out and interview subject matter experts and then they presented these to uh, faculty at ASU that deemed them good enough and faculty then incorporated them into their classes. So um, you don't need a big research group to turn out quality content. Um, that's the point I'm trying to share um, with, a, with a little um, workflow and some guidance on hardware and software. Um, teachers and students can build these themselves. And as far as what's coming down the pipe, um, you know, we, our research group avoided uh, any VR headset development um, because of the costs involved. And then all of a sudden, um, the Oculus Quest comes out and it's got a price point of two to $300. And I can tell you in the last semester course that I taught at ASU, um, uh, both my classes, I had um, 30 students in each class. In one class, 17 had uh, a VR headset and the other 14 had. So um, developing now for the VR headsets uh, is becoming more important. And if you think these 360 photos and these walkthroughs that I showed you in Sedona um, are immersive on your computer screen, wait until you see them in a 3D headset when there's nothing in your peripheral vision. And your sense of immersion is incredible. Um, you really feel like you're there. And then I have equipment that allows me to shoot 360 and 180 photos and videos in 3D. And most of the content, if you've been in a headset, is 360 degrees, but it's flat. It's in two dimensions. And if you've seen content in the field captured in 3D, think about it. That virtual reality headset is basically two eyeballs you're looking through. Um, so to see an environment in 3D is simply stunning. Um, so that's where this stuff is going. Um, you know, and then we have groups at ASU. I'm sure you all you know, have similar groups or are familiar with them. But, uh, you know, I had a friend bring me into his lab, put some, uh, I'm holding what looks like a wire mesh, um, a wire mesh trash basket. And it's hooked up to wires going into a computer. So I'm holding this wire mesh thing. He puts a headset on me and all of a sudden I'm in a physics lab. And this wire mesh thing that I'm holding, I now see as a bucket of water inside of this physics limb. And he tells me to grab it by the handle and to move it. Well, they programmed all of the fluid dynamic equations in there. The feedback I'm getting holding this thing, it feels like the water is swishing back and forth. And I'm getting that exact feedback as I'm walking with a bucket. Um, there's another group that is working on smells. Um, and haptic feedback. So uh, it's just, it's very exciting what's gonna happen uh, in the next few years as the resolution of headsets comes becomes higher um, and the cost to, and barriers to entry to getting into this becomes lower. I'm really excited about that. No, that's super exciting, Tom. Um, we're at the top of the hour here. And so I think we're gonna have to wrap up. Tom, uh, what's the best way for folks to reach out to you um, and make contact so if let they me... have further questions? I'm going to put my email and my um, cell phone in the chat. Oh, wow. You are super connected. Appreciate your time and your, uh, your generousness, uh, you know, your yeah, generosity so, reaching out and talking with folks. Please. I love, I love sharing this. So um, this is, uh, this is my, this is my second act now. Um, uh, I'm very excited about this. So if I can help you um, with anything from, Hey, I want to. I want to know. I I want to use ones that exist, and I need you to further prove that these things work too. I'm ready to build one. What cameras and software should I use? Please just feel free to reach out to me, and I'll be glad to help you. Thank you so much, Tom, and and thank you all for attending today's webinar. Uh, look for the recording on our AIPG YouTube channel. That'll be coming out soon. 
You can follow us on social media for notifications when content like that recording uh, gets released. Also, a couple of really quick reminders. We've got upcoming AIPG events tomorrow, Wednesday, May 24th at noon Mountain Time. We have a presentation on the Grand Scottish Tour. If anyone's interested in the tour of Scotland that AIPG will be running next summer, that one will not be virtual. That one will be in person. So that'll be exciting. Um, Tuesday, May 30th, we have a lunch and earn, the role of geological data collection in developing mineral resources. And also Wednesday, June 7 is our next AIPG town hall where Chris and Shanna are gonna share uh, more information about the 60th anniversary conference with us. So looking forward to having everybody on that. Happy birthday, AIPG.